big swings. Well, here it comes. Oh, my goodness. Have you seen anything like that? Big moments. There it is! Adam Scott, a life changer. All the news, all the views. The career grand slam. A launch to Corey Webb. Welcome to the PGA Golf Club. And welcome to another edition of the PGA Golf Club. Adam White, Brendan Goddard and Nick O'Hearn with you for this week's episode. We're going to spend a lot of time chatting to Nick. Uh, So many interesting things to talk to him about. And also we're going to be joined by Jack Trent. Now, if you don't know who Jack Trent is, he has just finished inside the top 30 on the PGA Tour at his first attempt in the field as an amateur uh, he goes to university in Las Vegas. His hero is Adam Scott. And he actually beat Adam Scott over 72 holes. He had an extraordinary time of it. He's just walked off the 18th green, and he will join us on the PGA Golf Club. Thomas Mazira will join us as well. We thought being Bathurst week, we should speak to Thomas because he's uh, playing uh, currently on uh, the Legends Tour here in Australia. And Craig Spence will be in the studio talking all things golf coaching. So plenty to get to, but we should say hello to everyone. Brendan Goddard, welcome. Whitey, how are you? I'm good. I'm good, but I'm excited. Not so much talking to you. Very excited. I talk to you all the time. But we have got Nick O'Hearn in the studio. Nick, uh, thanks for being part of the PGA Golf Club. Guys, great to be here. Looking forward to it. Well, Nick, you're back in Melbourne, Mm. uh, back in Australia, in Melbourne. Um, Tell us how long you've been here for and, and what made you move back from the States. Oh, it's the coffee, really. <laughs> <laughs> I miss the coffee. Um, no, we moved back in January. Been in the US about 12 years now and it was it was time to time to come back. Uh, the kids are getting to an age where it was now or never. I got two two girls, 16 and 13, who are, who are full on Americans with their accents, <laughs> even though they were born in Perth. And um, yeah, it's been just great being back and um, I'm sort of expanding my wings now. I stopped playing a few years ago. Uh, competitively full time, and now uh, just play part time on the Aussie circuit. I guess uh, you, you could say, and, and now I'm helping all the all the other golfers coming through, trying to help some uh, elite players, young pros, and as it turns out, I guess the last few months more just the everyday golfer, where I'm uh, meant, and it's more a mentoring role that I take on than, than a coaching or a technique type thing. I find my strengths lie more in um, course strategy, the mental side, and. Funnily enough, I started out a teaching pro uh, when I was young. Uh, in my early 20s, I wasn't good enough to play the game at that point and then um, figured out how to play for a while, for about 20 years or so, and, and now I've kind of come full circle. So it's, it's great to get back into that element, and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. BJ and I want to sort of expand a little bit more on that mental side of golf and course management that you talked mm. about. And of course, you've got your very popular book um, that we want to talk about as well. But just on your career, when you reflect back on it, um, for so long, you were such a consistently good player um, representing Australia all around the world. What Have you got a couple of highlights when you reflect back on it now? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, the funny thing was I'd never really won much. Uh, I really only won a couple of times here in Australia. I didn't win in the US or in Europe. I, I just had a lot of really good results. So, yeah, I got that nickname, Mr. Consistency, for a long period. And, and I used to get badgered by the press in the States, especially where... Uh, you know, they'd say, look, you're top 20 in the world, but you haven't won. How can you justify that? And I said, well, it's actually a compliment, I think, because um, it just means I'm quite consistent and I'm always up there. So my game lent itself to uh, a lot of consistent results, hit a lot of fairways, a lot of greens, and had a good short game. So don't hit it 300 metres, well, 300 yards for that, mate. I'd probably only get it out there about 240, 250 metres at the best of times. Um but, you know, the highlights, uh, definitely the Australian PGA back in 2006. I had a, That was probably my best season throughout my career. I think I was just on a bit of a tear and won the Order of Merit here, which was always a, a dream or a goal of mine. And then around that time, I played a couple of President's Cups, um, which is uh, you know, kind of a good topic to talk about with it being on this year again back in Australia, 2005 and 2007. So just witnessing and being around... Uh, other players in a team environment. Who was, was, who was, in, the, who was in your team at that stage? Oh, I reckon uh, we got, uh, there's quite a few Aussies, Stewie Appleby, Pete Lonard, Mark Hensby, Ogilvy, Scotty. Uh, so we had well, five or six of yeah. us, I reckon. Allenby might have been in one of them as well. So we made up almost half the team. So 
So the the camaraderie was great. Uh, we just I think the one chance we did have to win was was in 05 in Washington DC. Uh, Demarco just you know hold the putt on the last. I think couples hold the putt and we just got pipped. That was that was one that really got away. I think where we had a good chance to uh, to actually snatch one off them because it's been been a long time between <laughs> drinks, unfortunately. And then in 2007. We were in Montreal, and it almost felt like an American home game because um, you know, there was a lot of a lot of US people up there already. So I was dying to play the one down here in uh, Melbourne in, I think it was 2011, but um, yeah. at that point I was sort of coming off injuries and, and, and the game had almost gotten away from me a little bit by then. So how, how did you go playing when you didn't hit the ball as far as the others? And I mean, some of the distances that players hitting the ball now are mm. just crazy. Oh, incredible. But how do you focus on your own game and not trying to to match it with them or over hitting the ball and just playing inside your zone. Cause I think there's something in that for everyone that, that mm. likes playing golf is not to necessarily try and emulate what your playing partner's doing. Yeah, exactly. It's, I think it's good to watch other people and learn from other people. But one of my biggest strengths was I never got consumed by, uh, what other guys were doing, especially a match play. Funnily enough. I mean, I'm probably most well known in the States for being tiger a couple of times and to be out driven by 40 or 50 meters on most holes and not get, you know, kind of uh, put off by that is an interesting challenge. So, but that was my whole career. I was always 30, 40 yards behind guys. Um, but I just thought, well, I know I can't hit it that far. How can I be better than, than others? And one of the, an interesting stat for me was on par fives, I never went for greens in two basically because I couldn't reach them. Yet my scoring average was better than I was always in the top 10 mm. or 20 because my wedge game was so good. So I think for the average golfer out there, you, the best thing is to realize what your strengths are what your weaknesses are. Um, that was the other thing. I, I knew what I could and couldn't do, so I didn't try and do stuff that I shouldn't and um, and play to them and, and play more to your personality. I was a very steady, methodical golfer out there. and I'm sort of, I, I just wrote another article about playing to your personality for, uh, for one of the golf magazines, and, and I think that's a big part of it. You know, you just If you're an upbeat, hyper kind of person, don't try and slow things down on the golf course. And if you're a slow, methodical person, don't get all jumpy out there you know, and try and play quicker, which... A lot of people try and push and pull you in different directions. So uh, in my case, I just knew what I could and couldn't do. And uh, I worked my ass off. And, and more so, I think the mental game was a huge part where I could really make up ground on other players. Did you know leading into the year that it was only a number of courses you could potentially win at based on how the setups were, competition? Did, did you pick your tournaments to say, oh, I, I can perform well this week, course suits me, suits my game? A little bit that way. I mean, it, in the majors, that's tough because, I mean, Augusta, I, I, like Augusta, the Masters, I would, growing up, I thought this course just suits me down to the ground. It suits a nice fade for a left-hander. A couple of the tougher holes there, like the 12th is a par three. That's the easiest hole on the golf course for a left-hander. For right holes, it's a nightmare. I'm thinking, oh, I'd love to play here. And then Tiger blew the place apart in 97 and they lengthened it and I'm going, oh, no. <laughs> so, you know, it suits a long-hitting left-hander. Other courses that I thought, well, you know, I'm going to struggle around places like Houston and one year I finished third. So another one was Congressional. Like, that was a long, tough golf course. My first year I really struggled. The next year I played lights out. So you just never know when you're going to get hot in the game. Um, but definitely the course is more like... Uh, Colonial, uh, Hilton Head in the Hilton US, Head, yeah. Memorial. I mean, if I played a tournament at Hilton Head every week of the year, I would have been number one in the world. Yeah. That, that golf course, <laughs> I hit driver on every hole around there. Everyone else is hitting two irons. So <laughs> length, beca- I was actually the longest player yeah, that yeah. week. It was fantastic. <laughs> we talked, and it's the, the, the famous thing of you being able to beat Tiger in match play a couple of times. He tried to intimidate when he was on the golf course, and a lot of it got to do with his mental strength as well as his ability to hit the ball as, as he did. How did you intimidate on the golf course, or is that um, overstated when it comes to golf? Um, no, in Tiger's instance, I think he's very much got an awe about him. I mean, I think maybe I just bored the heck out of him. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly didn't have any, you know, intimidation factor. I, you know, in match play is a different game, and, and you can use this in local pennant matches and things like that. I mean, Brennan, you know, we spoke at the start of the year at Metropolitan, you know, with, with the pennant team there, and I sort of gave a couple of the tips that I – I tended to use, um, I like giving a putt early of three or four feet in match play, for instance, where you can, you know, almost put the opponent a bit on the back foot thinking, really, you just gave me that? Oh, okay. And then later on, uh, you, they might have a putt of the same length and, and you don't give it. And all of a sudden they're a bit put off by that. Oh, why didn't he give it to me? And, and you know, they're going to miss basically. So, but in stroke play events, it's, it's a whole new ball, you know, it's a different ball game because 
um, really you're just playing your own game against the golf course and, and it really only comes down to head to head I think on the last nine holes on a Sunday so uh, when you do have that chance um, my I think the area where I excelled in was because I was a short hitter I could hit my approach shots in first so in a way I was applying the pressure all the time yes it would have been nice to hit at 350 but um, yeah you got to kind of use what you have and 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 uh, and and lend it to your favour. Were you one that watched leaderboards? Yes, I did. Um, more so not until the back nine. I just like to see where I was and just figured, okay, what do I need to do here? Because if you're six shots behind, well, there's no point just paring in. I mean, hey, we've got to get something going. Or if you've got a six-shot lead, well, you don't need to attack flags. So I, I like to just get a gist of where I was, get a feel for it, and then plan accordingly in stroke play events for sure. Um, and my caddy would sort of keep an eye on it as well if, if I wasn't really taking much notice the mental side of the game and i want to bring you in here bj when it comes to to football lining up for goal 40 meters out uh in front of eighty thousand people versus 150 meters in to make make birdie to win a golf tournament take us through the mindset of that because this is nick what you're really Mm. big on i'll I'll start with uh, i'll start with you um because it is a golf show (laughs) um and, and what what goes through your mind when you're 150 meters out um, you might have water to the right and bunkers to the left and you're needing to make birdie. What What is going through your mind when it comes to a process thing to try mm. and make that as easy as possible? Well, the interesting part about golf to other sports like, like football is uh, golf, the ball is stationary. So you have to influence the movement of that ball, whereas in other sports it's more a reaction, I think. You know, the ball's moving or uh, in cricket you're just in the, the bowler, you're just reacting to whatever they deliver to you, similar to a, a kick in football, I think. It's funny, interesting, I've been taking notice of other sports more. Uh, set goal shots you know, in football has is, is become fascinating to me mm. because they, they struggle when they are you know, out in front and taking their time. A lot of them are now going to this hook-type kick just because it seems more comfortable and it's more of a reaction. So I try and build that into a golf shot um, where the first thing you have to do is really make a decision on what shot you want to play at that time. If you've got, for instance, 150 metres out, it might be a 7, a 6, 5 arm, whatever, whatever club you choose, you want to make sure, okay, what shot am I trying to play here? Where's the pin? What's, where's the wind coming from? Take in all those factors and come, you come to a decision basically on the shot that you want to hit. The important thing is to then cut off at that point and go, right, I'm committing to what I just decided on. From then, that's the point where I try and make the rest of it a reaction and it's more an execution process of, of being creative and, and feeling the shot. So the decision is all about using your mind and being logical uh, in that sense, and then the execution is more about feeling and, and being creative. So that's why people like to visualize the flight of a ball, for instance. Jack Nich- Nicholas used to say, oh, I, I go to the movies on a shot. You know, I love to see the flight where it lands and do all that. I'm very much in that mold. So then as I step into the ball and to the time I take to hit it, I'm really not thinking about much. I'm more feeling. It's a hard thing to explain in a way. Um, that's why I like to take people out in the golf course and show them these things. And... The most important part for me, I think, once you're over the ball is once you take that last look at your target, whether it be a putt, a chip, or a full swing, and you come back to the ball, you swing, you start your swing, or you pull your trigger straight away. When you come back to the ball and you get a little stationary over it and you hesitate, that's where the bad stuff happens. So if you can see the target, come back to the ball, react, that's why I talk about making it more of a reaction. I think that really improves golfers' rhythm and the flow to their game, and they tend to hit better shots, and they tend to think less. So yeah, that's a mate, huge part about so it. So go, go back to where you said you stand over it too long. So what mm. are those bad thoughts? Or what, what is the bad, or rephrase the question, what are the things you shouldn't be thinking about? Well, what I find is doubt creeps in. Uh, do I have the right club? Uh, geez, I don't want to hit this left. Um, what if I bogey this hole? It's all, it's all result-based it's thoughts. All it's outcomes. always result. Yeah. And, you know, we always talk about the process in golf. I just want to take one shot at a time, commit to the process. It's very cliche, but it's so true. Um, and the more time you have to think about it, the more those other thoughts can come in. That's why if you can react and i'll bring it back to a footy analogy if you know if you're standing there and you've got your 30 seconds or whatever it is to take your kick at goal after you've took a beautiful mark you've got all this time to think whereas if you're on the run someone just handballed it to you give it a rip there's no thinking it's just a reaction so i think that's why in in football people you know kick better when they're on the run for instance can you relate to that bj yeah that's that's why i think when i talk about footy but people as soon as they miss a shot or miss a shot they're expected to kick everyone comes back to 
generally it's about technique. Oh, you drop, drop the ball too high. But I was like, where's the discussion around the mental and what he's actually thinking? Because I totally agree with Nick that in football, and it's all about time to think, and it's all about time to think about outcomes. So the kick all of a sudden comes harder, which it isn't for a set shot as opposed to a mm. kick on the rung, is because you've got time to think. And that's what golfers, they spend four and a half hours thinking. Or, or you know most of us, but the trick is not to is think less. Mm. Yeah. So, so and to Jeff and I used to talk about. We used to say that professional sportsmen, probably golfers in particular, like would pay a lot of money to think less. <laughs> so if you can just simplify things and think less, I, you can, I'll ask Nick. But when he plays his best golf, I'm sure he's thinking less. He's like just in the moment, just see the shot, hit it. Like so, it's totally true. So you get more time to think about in golf, but then in football. The one thing that relates to golf the most, I think, is the set shot and the mental mm. side of the game. Is and the cop out for me is that snap around the corner. It's because they don't want to. It's like it is. It's a cop out. It's an excuse because they're expected to kick it with a drop punt. So then they, as soon as I see a guy turn on the side, it's like unless it's like on, on an angle or such. But the guy's on a forty-five degree angle is because he's already thought about missing it because he's like, well, I should kick a drop punt here and. But if I go to a snap, I've kind of got a cop out. So if I miss it, it's not as bad. And yeah. then it, then it's like, you know, they're kind of fragile anyway. Mm. As soon as they turn on the side, and so it's it's a great relation correlation between footy and golf, the footy set shot, and golf in general. About you know, four and a half hours in a round. Yeah, and and that's where having a and it's funny because I was I played golf a little while ago with a couple of footy guys, Jack Gunston and Liam Shields from Hawthorne, and I was talking to Jack a bit about it because you know he's obviously a forward. And then that's where in golf we have a pre-shot routine. I, I sort of spoke to him about a pre-kick routine and, and things like that. So maybe they just haven't got the pre-kick routine down to the down to the point where um, you know that they're comfortable with it. And in golf, you have to be. I mean, that's why pros and everyone has their, their own pre-shot routine. But that's why it's so important, you know, so that you can number one go through that decision-making process and then number two execute. So if you have that down to a point where it's almost on autopilot, that's where you want to be. And when you play your best golf. Uh, as you mentioned, you come off the golf course and you think, mm, didn't really think too much about that. That was a pretty easy day. The other side to that is between shots. So between shots is where you think the most, I, I believe. <laughs> and that's the hardest skill in golf is to be able to switch off between shots because you're always going, oh, wow, this, this next stretch of hole is pretty tough. I, uh, I better play well here or, geez, I just double bogeyed that and I'm, why did I do that shot, et cetera, et cetera. They're all result-based thoughts, but between shots is where it gets really interesting. Here. So you mean that when I'm walking down the fourth I'm, and I'm already looking about, oh, there's the fifth over there, I don't like that tee shot, I probably shouldn't be worrying about that yet. I've got to worry about the fourth hole until I play the fifth. It's probably not going to help you. <laughs> <laughs> um and and it's funny, I'm talking to a couple of guys at the moment who they say, look, I get through 13 or 14 holes and my round's going really well. And the last four or five holes, I just, I, I fall to pieces. Mm. And it's because of exactly that. They All of a sudden, between shots, they start thinking, oh, I've got a good score going. Yeah. I really have to knuckle down here. After you hit a golf shot, it really doesn't matter what's happened. Just get away from the game. Think about something else. Chat to your playing partners. Um I, in my book, I write about uh, switching on and switching off, and I use my glove. Um, whenever I took my glove off, that was my key to switch off. My caddy knew that. We'd just start talking about cricket, football, whatever was on at the time, soccer. Um, and then and when I got about 20 yards to the ball, the glove would come back out, and he'd know to tamper down the, uh, the, the talk about other stuff, and now we're starting to lock in on the golf again. And then through a round of golf, if I hit, say, if I shot 70 for the round, Maybe half a dozen of those are going to be tap-ins on putts. So say you've got 64 or 65 shots where you really have to focus. I wanted 64 or 65 short bursts of focus. The rest of the time in between was just kind of Jewish whatever. Fat. Yeah, just, you know, you're not really thinking about golf. What tends to happen is people have about 10 to 20 long periods of focus. You know, they hit a shot and they walking down the fairway. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I've got to switch off or they, you know, start talking about you know, why did he just hold that part or why did I just three part or, or whatever it is? So it's a fascinating game, golf, and it's over four or five hours. It's kind of crazy. I feel like I'm lying on the couch here <laughs> getting a, a more a psychological lesson than a, than a golf lesson. <laughs> We're about to be joined by Jack Trent, and I'm really looking forward to catching up with Jack because he's done some amazing things in Las Vegas today, and we'll, we'll hear his story shortly. But just one final one on course management, Nick, because... Um, I think it's a really interesting topic, which we probably don't have enough time to go through today, but 
We spent so much time talking about the technical side of the game, and Craig Spence will talk to us a little bit later on with his with his regular golf lesson. But just some some ideas around for the people that are listening today that might play a handicap of fourteen or six or twenty one of how you can actually pick up shots in your round by just thinking a little bit more around the golf course. Mm. It's it's a, and I've been thinking about this a lot since writing the book. I mean, while I was doing it throughout my career, it was just almost second nature in a way, but. The more I think about it, and I, in a way, I got to be careful because the, there's teaching pros out there that, that do a great job, and some people do need to change their swings and work on technique and things like that. But if you make two or three better decisions in a round of golf, that's at least two or three shots, maybe four or five, depending on your level. So a 15 marker can drop to a 11 or 12 mark just by thinking better. Didn't change anything else. Now, how do you do that? Well, that you know, a little bit of that comes down to how you practice, I believe. Um, part of it comes down to building a pre-shot routine that you can rely on because that's what people probably struggle with the most out on the golf course. They don't have a process that they can go through each and every time. They're always worried about a result. Now, if you take that result into the uh, decision-making and then forget about it and then just execute, it frees the game up and your golf swing up so much more. And then there are little things like, well, you know, rather than hitting driver off this hole, that's bringing some trouble into play. Why don't I hit a three-wood or a or a hybrid off the tee or things like that. Um, Rather than taking on the hero shot through the trees, why don't I just pitch out and make bogey my worst score? (laughs) You know, there's there's a whole list of things we can talk about, but it's a very easy thing to set, you know, it's kind of weird saying it, but you can drop shots off your handicap quite simply by thinking better out in the golf course. It's like he's talking directly to me. It's quite unnerving, Veg. You're asking the question. Yeah. I'm asking the question so I can help me. Um, and your book's been so popular, but for those that haven't read it but might want to, there's a bit of an opportunity here to give it a plug. Yeah, yeah it's called Tour Mentality, Inside the Mind of a Tour Pro, um, which can be a scary place at times. <laughs> but uh, it wasn't something I planned on writing. It came about more because I was helping some friends in the States uh, with their golf you know, on, on a on a hole out there and we started talking about the mental game and he said you should write a book on this I said nah there's plenty of good ones out there <laughs> and he said yeah but you've actually played the game for a living you've had to hold six foot putts to make cuts you know the sports psychs they haven't so uh, the more I thought about it I thought yeah there might be something in this and, uh, and the book sort of evolved from there and, and it's just it's great now just helping especially for me you know the young pros and elite amateurs coming through I'm taking on a bit more of a mentor, mentor role and I wish I'd have had someone that I could have, you know, bounced ideas and questions off when I was growing up because a lot of my stuff was sort of had to figure out by myself. And I tried to surround myself with some, you know, a really good coach and a good sports psychologist early on. And, and now I get to um, share my ideas. And, and look, I'm not saying it's, it's the right, but what I try and do, try and do is provide a framework for people and then they need to make it their own. And, and that's really all you can do for golfers out there. What works for one may not work for another, but I think the entire framework and the right structure, you can work off that and then fill in the gaps yourself. Oh, that's fascinating. That is, I just have loved that. That's been terrific to, to talk to you, especially with you in the studio to ask all those questions. I'm sure plenty of people listening to this uh, will get something out of that to help their own, own golf game. We're going to take a very short break. And Jack Trent is going to join us. Not too many people will know much about Jack, but uh, he's got a great story to tell that just got even better uh, just today. So we'll speak to him next. Everything you want to know about Aussie golf is in one place. PGA.org.au. This is the official site of the PGA of Australia. It's the one website loaded with all the tournament, course and player news. That includes the latest on the ISPS Handa PGA Tour of Australasia. The Find a PGA Pro directory will track down the pros near you. And here's where you can live stream golf's best on PGA TV. Watching tournaments live, streaming replays or watching the latest reports on Aussie golfers around the world. There are even video tips from the pros. So if golf's your game, this is your site. pga.org.au From the Professional Golfers Association of Australia. Driving Australian golf since 1911. Welcome back to the PGA Golf Club. And this is going to be a real treat because... uh, an amazing story has happened over in Las Vegas involving a young Australian golfer called Jack Trent. Now, Jack is at university in Las Vegas, 
and got to play on the PGA Tour this week in the Shriners Hospitals uh, for Children Open. And he has done incredibly well. And uh, he's only literally just got off the 18th green and he joins us now from Las Vegas. Jack, thanks very much for joining us. No worries. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, what a week you have had. Can you put it into words? Yeah, just very special. Um, it was kind of... I, I got the exemption through winning our home tournament back in March. And, um, you know, I was thinking, oh, it's like eight, eight months away. So uh, we got plenty of time. And then we got to seven, six, five, and then all of a sudden it was two weeks out. And I'm thinking, uh, holy, you know, this is actually happening. So, uh, to be in this position and, you know, perform at a very high level and um, beat some quality names and just uh, perform for all my family and friends out here is just uh, unreal. You know, it feels so good. Yeah. Well, there's so many questions to ask you. You finished the tournament incredibly 14 under after a final round three under par to be inside the top 30. It is an extraordinary achievement as an amateur. But before we talk about the actual tournament, you captured my imagination when I saw something on the PGA Tour about you and Adam Scott getting together to have a round of golf, having both come from the same university. Talk us talk us through that, that how it was like to play with your absolute idol that you tried to model your golf game around. Back when I was yeah, starting to take golf seriously. Um, my coach, my swing coach back in Australia, I'm sunny coach, uh, Peter Heinegger, we're always trying to model my swing off Adam Scott. You know, he does so many fundamentals so well, so we're always just trying to build off that. So that's just, you know, one of the best foundations for a golf swing there is. Um, so, you know, I ended up going to the same high school as him, same home club, and now same college. Uh, so I'm not... I keep telling him I'm not a stalker. It's just a crazy <laughs> coincidence. <laughs> um, and he's like, yeah, yeah, right. And then, <laughs> um, but yeah, to play with him this week um, was pretty special to me because I remember asking for his autograph when I was about 10, 11 years old. I was at half his size. Um, you know, now to be you know looking him in the eyes and uh, hitting shots with him, yeah, it's just uh, kind of like a dream come true a little bit. So, but it felt really good. Hey, Jack. Uh, yeah. So you're at uh, UNLV, correct? Yeah, I am. Uh, yeah, it's a really good school from what I hear. I mean, it's interesting. I've been in the States while well, I just moved back to Australia, but uh, had a bit to do with a couple of the colleges over there. And the, the college system really is uh, phenomenal at the moment. I mean, um, they're really just producing these almost tour-ready players as they come out, like Morikara and Wolf mm-hmm. and uh, Victor Hovland. Um, yeah. I mean, are you finding yeah. how are you finding the college system? It must be so good to be getting some good, uh, good, good work going before you get out on tour, hopefully. Yeah. No, I um. If you look at the names inside the top ten for top ten, fifteen for collegiate golf, honestly, most of those guys can beat half the guys out here on tour already. Mm. Um, they're just they're just so primed and ready and just um, fearless as you know you can see with Matt Wolf and Colin Arcola, come straight out of college and you know win an event. Um, the courses they set up for us in college are a lot harder, I think. Um, <clears throat> They just have no care for your well-being with pin placements, uh, so they just stick it in slopes and you know tuck it. Um, so I, it's kind of like almost like a breather playing this week with the pins. They're a bit they were fair, and you could you know attack it and use your skill. Sometimes in college, you just got to hit in the middle of the green and try and two putt. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the yeah the level of competition is that I think uh, just under the you know Corn Ferry Tour, which used to be called the Web dot com. Um, but yeah, some of the top amateurs in the world right now, I think, can honestly beat half the guys out here on PGA Tour. Not to say that not every day, but I mean, if some of these amateurs get hot, you know, it's kind of almost over. So amazing, yeah. And um, it was TPC Summerlin was the course. Did, did you know that course well? I, I've, I've played there a number of times in that tournament, and I know Aussies have done well. I think Andre Stoltz won around there, and Rod Pampling, oh, yeah. I think, uh, from memory, yeah. So. It's a drier course where the ball runs out, so a little more Australian, I think, than the than the typical um, uh, American courses. But obviously, being in in Nevada, you're going to get that those dry courses. Did you know it very well? Yeah, um, when I first moved in 2014, I was a member there for about a year and a half, um, so I had a lot of knowledge. Um, but since starting at college, I haven't been out there a whole lot. Just mainly been at Sodden Islands and Shadow Creeks, which are home courses. Um, but I mean, the memory is, you know. After playing it just once or twice, all everything came back to me. So, just uh, slightly 
most quads off the tee. I didn't get dry through everywhere. I just wanted it too high with the three wood. Um, but, you know, a lot of course knowledge. So I felt really comfortable out there. And, you know, once you tee off... <coughs> Once you tee off and you get over the first tee jitters and stuff like that, you know, you're still playing golf. It's not like it's anything different. Um, so you just try and, try and settle into your own game and don't worry about what the pros are doing. You know, they've got the big staff bags and, you know, nice clothes, nice clothes, and they hit some cool shots. But you got to try and... I know I was looking at them for the first couple of rounds and thinking, oh, cool, that's really cool. And then... You know, some of the shots I was seeing, you know, it's just as good. So you kind of have to not focus on them, even though you're cool watching them and you're inside the ropes with them, but you have to, like, focus on your own game, especially for amateurs and guys just turning pro, uh, to not get overwhelmed. So I think I did a good job of not overwhelming myself this week with um, the whole scheme of, you know, big, big grandstands and lots of people. Uh, so, Jack, what what is it? do now for you personally you obviously then go you know you're saying you potentially go back to, to school tomorrow you got a weight session um sorry go back to uni so yeah. what now you've you've tasted two of life experience you've done well is this change your your kind of plan and what you may do and where are you with college what like again you're, you're a bit of an unknown we don't know much about you <laughs> so tell us about where you're at and how what why college and um, why not stay in australia and go through the golfing golf australia system here I moved when I was about 15 and a half, and what I noticed with a lot of the guys where I grew up from, I came from kind of like a surfy town on the Sunshine Coast. Um, and when I was about 13, 14, I was always looking up to these guys that were around 17, 18. So I thought they were really good players. And then, you know, a couple of years later, they were you know, still there and not really, I think, developing um, as well as they could be. Um, I think... Golf Australia does an amazing job, don't get me wrong, but there's no like there's no in between between junior golf to professional golf. Um, and that's what the college system over here is so good at. Is you know, you go from junior golf and you've got however long you want to be in college, you wanna be four years or two years, that's up to you. Um, but it's just a really strong kind of uh, feeder and test um, of your game and see because if you are winning and college tournaments and you know, shooting par or better on almost every course to come out here and play. Um, I think it kind of shows that you are a bit ready to turn pro and you really... Um, how do I put it in words? It's just Australia doesn't have that. I mean, I love my own country, obviously, but I needed something that could help me develop more uh, from junior to professional golf. And that's why I chose to moved here because I felt college could really help develop my game mentally and physically and, you know, really test my ability uh, before I turned pro. So what are, you, what are your plans now? Um, I got a year and a half left of college. Um, so planning on doing all four years right now unless something uh, crazy happens, is, you know, if I win a pro tournament. But um, got a year and a half left. Um, we're just trying to get really primed and ready. You know, but I don't think it's done any harm to Colin Malcara. He's done all four years and he's you know, very consistent. Got a win out here on the tour. Um, so yeah, that's my plan right now, just to keep my head down and keep working. Doesn't mean you know made it or anything, um, but the very good find that whatever I've been doing has been working. So I'm really excited to get back out there and keep, you know keep working. So, Jack, you've gone 67, 69, 66, and 68 to finish uh, inside the top 30 um, at 14 under par, and you have finished ahead of a lot of very high-profile golfers. What does that do for your confidence, and can you actually believe that you've done it? Yeah, I tried to... I mean, when I was down the course, I was looking at the leaderboard, but once I got home, all I wanted to do was just look at the tee time and then, you know, tee off. I tried not to look at the leaderboard and see who, was, who I was ahead of or who was just ahead of me or was around me. Um, but, you know, I've, I've had a good look at it now. The tournament's done, and um, it's a bit surreal because, uh, you know, six months ago, I was watching the PJ Tour. Um, even, honestly, two weeks ago, I was just watching. I don't watch a whole lot of golf because um, I'm traveling a lot, but... A couple of weeks ago, you know, just watching, you know, these guys out on tour, just playing, and you see them on TV, and then all of a sudden they're here in person. It's like, oh wow, you are real. <laughs> you know? um, 
which is kind of it was kind of funny, but it's like yeah, these guys do exist, you know, you know. Um, so to beat a couple high profile names just proves to myself that hey, like what you're doing is working. You can do this, you know. You're big enough, you're strong enough. You get your putter hot, you know, and you can make a lot of putts and a lot of birdies. You know, you do belong out here. Um, maybe just not yet, but I mean. Uh, it is my home course. I did have some home course knowledge, but I I do feel as I can compete almost um, with a lot of these guys. So I just I just proved that to myself. So you beat your uh, practice playing partner, I noticed, Adam Scott, right? He finished uh, <laughs> a few places behind you, so well done on that, mate. That was yeah. awesome. But uh, what what's next? Uh, college season uh, on at the moment? Uh, some big big tournaments coming up? Yeah, I've got one more college event in Florida. And um, I think Orlando, um, that's my last one for the season. And then I think I have yep. one in Houston, Texas. Um, I'll be representing Australia for, it's like the Spirit International or something. Um, you know, 15 countries there, so that'll be cool. Um, and then I'm coming back to Australia in January to play Masters of the Amateur and Aussie Amateur. Um, I think Aussie ends at Water Queensland this year, so... I uh, thought I'd come back and see all my mates on the coast and play my old home course and you know, catch up with my old swing coach and see how everything's going. So, um, yeah, just get one more college tour and then looking forward to coming back home in Australia in a couple of months. The one in Orlando, is that the Tavistock Cup out of interest? Yeah, Tavistock at Iowa. Yeah, I know that one very well. They, uh, you get some of the best college players in the country and usually whoever wins that event pretty much makes it out on tour because, you know, Ricky Fowler's won there, Jordan Spieth, all these guys. So um, I'll uh, yeah. I'll be watching with interest, mate, and if you need any uh, local no- local knowledge, let me know because that's, that's my, my home course. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm told it's a great event and a really good venue, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. But go a couple of weeks off first, so I can finally uh, sleep in, maybe. Actually, I can't tomorrow. I'm going to be up at 5. Congratulations. Uh, we were dying to catch it today after what you were able to achieve, and uh, we appreciate the fact that you've pretty much gone straight from the 18th green to, to chat to us. It's an incredible achievement, and hopefully it springboards you to many more successes into the future. Congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate that. Jack Trent joining us there live uh, from uh, Las Vegas after an amazing finish. Uh, Nick, in his first tournament, uh, against the professionals. He's still an amateur. He's still going to the university that can finish inside the top 30 and be sub-70 for four consecutive rounds. It's amazing. and I mean, the level of golf these days, I, I, I witnessed it firsthand. I, I did a little bit of work with a couple of colleges who were more, you know, maybe 70 or 80 ranked uh, colleges in the States, and there are so many colleges. I mean, in Division One, there's 300 alone, and then there's three divisions. So imagine how many there are. And all these guys could really play. So... I mean, if you think about the top 10 colleges, it's just amazing. And um, that event, funnily enough, he's going to the Tavistock Collegiate. That's, um, they, they, they run that like a tour event, so he's going to love it there. <laughs> so what, you, what you've seen, Nick, what it, so you, you've seen Golf Australia now, the talent pathway here. If you gave advice to a kid tossing up between going down Jack's path and plenty of other Australians that have gone and played college golf, or to stay here in Australia and try and go through the Golf Australia system, VIS here in Victoria, what, what would be your advice? I think there's a case for both. I, I, I like the college system now because obviously you get the education. Um, you know, you get a degree out of it if you stay the, the full term. And you get to play some really um, some really good golf courses, some good tournaments. It does, you know, it, as we're noticing, you are getting tournament ready. But, you know, the program here as well is, is, is very well run. And, and um, you know, I'd, I'd love to see local talent developed and stay in country basically and and one of my goals since being back is to take on more of a mentoring role with these young players and help them get to the next level because there is a bit of a gap at the moment I'm finding here. Where is, that, is that the gap where it, Jack was saying that because he's got competition mm. practically all year round, where here in Australia the amateur golf is kind of summer. There's not there's competition all year round's a bit kind of thin and. Perhaps, and the level yeah. as well. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been out of the, the the system for a little while here because I've been in the US. So, 
you know, week in, week out over there, there's there's a tournament on. Yeah. Basically, you can play whatever you want, and 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 it's um, there's always some competition here in Australia. Yeah, I'm I'm talking more about the gap of of how do you transition that that really elite amateur to making a successful career out of it because we're having players. I'm I'm not going to name names, but you know who who looked as though they were going to be number one type players in the world have that potential, but it's it's taking them longer or they're they're not quite fulfilling that potential and and you know how do you how do you get those players to the next level well it does help to have uh, it's funny you know jeff and myself have both both moved back to australia at the same time so it'd be great to um you know maybe offer some words of advice and help these players along just so we can uh, um, you know, get Australian golf up on that map again. We've got a very special guest who is about to join us uh, being Bathurst week. I'll explain more in a moment. But just one final one. It was something that was quite noticeable just talking to Jack then is that when these guys are coming through, they're not intimidated. They've got incredible belief. and They believe like they belong. And Jack just mentioned that. Now, the result suggests well, he's got to do it week in, week out, but that he can compete. But... That mental side of, of doubts and so forth doesn't seem to be in that young player, particularly the young American player coming through. And I think it's, it's in a way, it's a knock-on of the Tiger effect. I think, you know, when he came through and he had that aura of invincibility, you, you basically try and copy your, you know, the heroes or the, or the people that that, that uh, you, you look up to as you're coming along in your game. And, and when you look up to someone like Tiger, there's not too many flaws there as far as the mental game goes and, and obviously swing-wise as well. So that's a pretty cool one to look up to. And I think the guys are just getting great training over there now. You know, they have these sports psychologists on tap, basically at all the colleges. The amount of money that is spent in college golf over there is phenomenal, um, college sports in particular. Uh, so they have these resources and they're getting great training, great advice, and they're also having these people before them who are just coming through the ranks and um, and they're learning off them and going, well, we are good enough and, and we can do it. And, you know, that, that old American um, mindset of, you know, rah, 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 we're confident and everything like that is th- – there's something to be said in that. I think in Australia it's slightly different. If you appear a little arrogant and a little um, confident, you know, you're – you are seen as cocky and, and arrogant, basically. Whereas in the states, they promote that; they love it. They go, "Yeah, you're the man. You are so good." And uh, you know, the top players over there, they just see themselves on Sports Center, just feeding the beast, basically. You know, it's um, they're getting their ego fed all the time, and and that's that's a an elite sport at that level. That's important. Whereas when people say, "Oh, maybe you should tone it down a little," or maybe you're getting ahead of yourself, hang on. Well, you know, am I really this good? Then the doubts creep in and things like that. So. The Americans have it right in that in that side of things, I believe. Fascinating insights uh, from Nick O'Hearn, who is uh, we're very lucky to have as a co-host of the PJ Golf Club this morning. We're going to sort of switch it up a little bit here because it is Bathurst week, and uh, so we thought we'd catch up with Thomas Mazira because Thomas Mazira knows how to win Bathurst. He's done that, but he's also now on the well the seniors tour when it comes to golf here in Australia. So we thought we'd get Thomas on. Thomas, uh, welcome to the program. Yeah, good morning. How are you doing there? We're going pretty well. It's a, it's an amazing thing that you've done to go from being a, a racing car driver to essentially a professional golfer. What what made you make the switch? Well, I always uh, always was interested in golf, like uh, after about age of 30. And uh, I wish I would have started earlier. And uh, when finally I stopped uh, driving cars, so I... Uh, I was about mid forty. I gave myself five years to get a little better in golf and uh, and try to get uh, on the senior tour. And uh, yeah, I got my handicap down to about two and uh, and went through the two school and I managed to get through on a on a first time in a, through the two school. And uh, you know, it's just fantastic opportunity that something like that. You know, it's it's possible to do for a for a hacker like me because I'm I'm not really a golfer. I just enjoy it and I like it. And uh, sometimes I play well, but not very often. Yeah. <laughs> so when you made the decision, you said you you're going to give yourself five years. Um, what was your handicap then to be able to get it down to as low as you did in the end? Oh, uh, I was probably about uh, just about in single figures. You know, playing nine or eight, something like that. And uh, yeah, then it's just sort of a hard work, and uh, and I was sort of a bit stubborn. I never had any lessons, you know. I just grabbed it and ripped it, and uh, 
you know, hope for our best. And, uh, and I wish I would have set up those and, and get some basic rides. And uh, it wasn't really until uh, until I started playing on the two, I, I got uh, I got a bit of a help from my uh, from my mates. I travelled with, you know, I travelled with my Tickle and Brad Burns, and uh, and Burns is Burns is one order of merit for the last two years on the on the senior tour, and uh, and they gave me the advice, and uh, and it's sort of you know. Uh, I think I play better sometimes because of that, and uh, and I wish I would have done it earlier. And I would recommend anyone who would like to sort of uh, try to get on the tour and try to get better, just go and get an advice, go and get a lesson. I was too stubborn. Yeah. yeah. So Thomas, how how has the senior tour been? Is it kind of what you'd hoped, and and what are some of what some of the things you take away and you've learnt? Oh man, it's, it's just fantastic because I was. Competing on my life in the, in something like when I was a kid, back at home I, I was sort of doing snow skiing and a, and a tennis and uh, then I you know came to Australia and I, I always wanted to do model racing and I was competing all my life in model racing and uh, and then you get over forty and and that's it in model racing like in a top level model racing like once you're in the mid forty that's it you know you you gone and uh, it's just great. To, to have that opportunity to compete and, and measure yourself against the, the best and uh, and the boys I kind of watched on TV when uh, in, a, in a sort of those mid 90s and uh, now I, I play play with them and uh, it's just great opportunity it's, it's sort of a great lifestyle. Yeah, well, that was one of the things I was actually going to ask about the racing side of things. Is is there an age um, that comes along? You mentioned that 40-ish. I mean, that's the beauty of golf is you can keep playing it and as you're finding out into the seniors tour, is it is it more a 20-something type of uh, type of sport or into the 30s or what's sort of the cutoff would, point there? I, I would say I would say moderation, moderation like that. your best age, best years are from 19 to 25 and uh, after that, you sort of gain the experience and, uh, you know, because of the experience, you, you're still good and uh, you're probably a little better. But uh, to actually have that, uh, you know, the bravery and uh, and the mindset to it, I think between that 1925 is the best age. And, uh, and uh, you know, unfortunately, once you get over, over 40, like the mid-40, you know, suddenly your eyesight deteriorates and that. Uh, and there's a bit of a delay from what you see, how, how you react to it. And uh, it's uh, probably time to give it away. And, uh, you know, there are a few exemptions in a, in a sport, like uh, look at Peter Brock. He probably could go to Hill, you know, till he was 50. Jimmy Richards in this country, he was unbelievable. He, he still was competitive after 50. But uh, And Craig Clance to some Sort of extent, you know, it's amazing. We used to call him a junior when he started, but like he's sort of over forty now, and he stepped down from a full-time driving. But uh, he still will do pretty good as a as a co-driver, and especially this weekend at Bathurst. You know, I, I, I still think he can uh, he can win it as a co-driver. It would be hard to win it for him as a lead driver, but he can win it as a co-driver, giving uh, giving a bit of a help to Jamie Winter. Mm, amazing. Um, we, we we talk about bravery in golf. You know, 150 meter shot over water. We think we're pretty brave taking it on. But uh, you know, you're talking life and death in the racing side of things. Uh, has that sort of helped? You know, maybe make the transition a little easier for you in the sense that it isn't life and death. Ah, oh, well, you know, that's the beauty of uh, of golf. You hit it out of bounds. You just reach for another ball. Tee up and <laughs> up. You know, like in motor racing, you smack the wall and that's it. You know, you. Mm. You out of the race, and uh, it's uh, yeah. But unfortunately, what I'm finding uh, the biggest difference between motor racing and golf is uh, you got too much bloody time between the shots. <laughs> it's got too much time to think about it, and uh, and you really can uh, you know your mind can destroy you. And uh, in motor racing, was more of an instinct. You just get on with it. You know, golf. 
unfortunately, you've got too much time to think about it. Well, Thomas, it's been great to catch up with you and uh, and just share your story to go from one sport to another and such an extreme difference. It's been a, a hell of an achievement. And uh, can continue. Good luck with it all. Okay. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, for those people who are listening, like, uh, just, you know, take up golf and uh, and get on with it because it's just just fantastic sport you can do for a long, long time. Yep. Yeah. Well, you've certainly motivated me. I'm back on. I reckon I can get there by on 50. So that you've given yeah, me some join, motivation. Come join us, Nick. Yeah, come and join us on a tour. <laughs> it might be easier said than done, but we'll certainly give it a go. A couple of years away. Thomas no, Mazira. As well. Thomas, that's right. Thomas Mazira joining us on the PGA Golf Club. We'll take a short break. Craig Spence is going to join us in the studio as our resident uh, coach. And he's going to tell us, this is very exciting, how to play like Patrick Cantlay. I want to hear more. We'll do that next. RSN Podcast. All your favourite RSN shows and loads of new programs. You can listen all download wherever, whenever. And now we're on iHeartRadio, the world's number one radio and podcast app. RSN Podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts and at rsn.net.au. And now on iHeartRadio. It's free at your app store or head to iHeart.com. And welcome back to the PGA Golf Club. Now, we've got Craig Spence from the Albert Park Driving Range uh, with us, as uh, as always, giving his uh, tip of the week. Craig, you're in the studio with us this morning. Uh, welcome. Yeah, good to First time in the studio, Adam. Absolutely. So uh, I found it eventually. <laughs> now, what we're going to do with you is when you come in and give tips, you're going to try and sort of relate it to something that you've seen on, whether it be the European Tour or the PGA Tour. Um, to try and sort of get our listeners to replicate what's actually happening out on tour and, yep. and just explain a little bit more about why they hit the shots they hit and, and how they hit them. And there was something that caught your attention on the weekend. Yeah, well, um, the Shriners is on in Las Vegas this week and any time Kevin Nars involved, I like to watch because he's an interesting unit. But I'm not referring to Kevin this time. I watched... Patrick Cantlay play a couple of pitch shots. And if, if the listeners go to um, the round three highlights, they'll see two pitch shots in particular that Patrick Cantlay plays. And why I like him is I get asked about how do you spin the ball all the time. That's like this first one's length, consistency, and then how do I spin it? And Patrick Cantlay hits these two pitch shots that are skip, skip, spin right beside the hole. And I think it's a great one for our listeners to... Um, to learn about absolutely now I'm, i want to take notes on this myself to be honest <laughs> so the, how do you do it all right so the myth is that you have to hit down on it and, and a lot of players when they do that they shut the face down they hit down on the back of the ball sure but that de-lofts the shot too much and the ball takes off too much what you'll notice when you watch pat patrick in the in the highlights film is that he actually barely takes a divot and what he actually does is he has the club set up very neutral. He takes the club back on the inside a little bit on the natural play and the natural curve. And he comes back, but he's shallow under the ball. He comes under the ball quite shallow and just clips it off the turf. The ball shoots out. One of them's about oh, 50 metres. The other one's about 40, 35, 40. And the ball skips and checks. So for our listeners, if they want to practice that, what they can do is they can set up a couple of um, alignment sticks facing towards the, the flag stick. Probably want to be about 40, 50 metres out. And they have to take the club back a little bit to the inside, come back to, with a neutral shaft. So what I mean by that is they're not going to try to put their hands in front of the ball. They're going to come back and the club should slide shallow under the ball, almost almost barely take a divot. And they're only going to go back to about a hip or a, or a, or a sort of rib cage height on their backswing and stop on a rib cage height on the follow through too. So what I'm thinking I'll do is I might even film a video yeah, and, and we'll, we'll drop it in somewhere yep. so that I can actually show people who want to go to it and actually learn how to hit a pitch shot that checks or skips and then checks. Yeah, absolutely. We'll put that on the PGA to a social media sites and even on the RSN side as well just to, to get sort of a visual understanding of it. Um, I've got a heap of questions just yeah. from what you've been talking about. How much of it has to do with the golf ball you're using? <laughs> well, yeah, it's a great question. I'm glad you said that because, first of all, you need a lie that is certainly not into the grain, preferably down grain. 
you don't want a wet or, or a clay base is more difficult. So if you're on the clay base courses where you've got a lot of winter grass and that, it's much harder to spin the ball. So you, those sand belt courses are much better and, you know, sandy. And so the club can bounce a little bit off the turf. You don't want a club that's going to dig in too much. And, yeah, look, I'm a Titleist man, so Pro V1 <laughs> or Pro V1X works every time. So the, the, the harder golf ball, is it harder to do it or is that a myth? It's much harder to do okay. it. You know, you're really kidding yourself if you want to start, you know, using the hard ball and go out there and hit fizzes all day. So, yeah. um, look, the most important two factors would be a good golf ball and a good lie. You're not going to do it out of rough. You're not going to do it out of, uh, you know, wet clay based sort of winter grass. Um, you need those factors and a little bit of um, dry weather helps too. So what about what about loft for, yeah. for the amateurs? I think for the spinner, you probably want to go to that 56 or 60. But if you want to play a consistent shot, I think, you know, most of the amateurs I teach are better off to stick with a gap wedge or a pitching wedge. And and that way they keep it a bit more open. They don't shut it down too much. When they grab the 60, they push the hands way forward, back in the stance, and they get that leading dig into the ground. And that scares them, scares them a lot. <laughs> no, that makes perfect sense. Because the other question I've got is... Uh as a proper, BJ thinks he's a professional. I'm, I, I will be one day, but I'm just not there at the moment. <laughs> is around the actual equipment you're using. Because the one thing my dad always says to me is, Adam, how you, do you expect to spin the ball when your clubs are so dirty <laughs> and the, gr- the grooves are not clean and things like that? How much of an impact does that have on, on trying to spin the golf ball as well? Yeah, You're, you're reading my mind, mate, because <laughs> um, fresh wedges... With fresh grooves, will spin a lot more as they get older, and you wear them out in bunkers. You wear them out with stones hitting the faces, and just overuse of the golf ball, the grooves get dinted a little bit or sort of pushed down a little bit. So those fresh edges. There's been a few blokes I know that redo their grooves on on the sly every now and again, <laughs> uh, but we won't we won't advise that. But fresh Vokey wedges, again, Titleist man, or whoever your your preferred company is would help a lot. And you want to get a bounce that suits your particular angle of attack too. If you're steep, you want to get a bounce that's going to help that club not dig in too much. If you're shallow, get less less bounce on it. Now, Nick Ahern, you've uh, you're sitting there. And you've, it's great that you're a co-host with us today, but you've, you've been nodding through most of what Craig's been saying there. Have you got some input into what's being discussed at the moment? Yeah, I was going to say clean grooves is the biggest one. I think most amateurs, they, they tend to be quite dirty and they go, well, why didn't that spin? Well, we'll check your grooves, mate. You know, just uh, give them a bit of a rinse. Um, one of the, It's funny, you know, that, that shallow angle into the, into a, into the golf ball is, is actually quite important. I like to vary my trajectory, so I'll move my hands forward, back, just depending on the shot. I think one of the best short game uh, exponents I ever came across was Lee Jansen. You know, the U.S. Open, W.S. Open champion in the U.S. And I used to watch him practice, and he hit some amazing shots around the green out of the rough. And a lot of the time, he's talking about that little inside path. Like, he'd, he'd open his 60 degree up in rough and take a, almost like a little hook swing. He'd take the inside path, come into it really shallow, and the ball would just come out high, soft, dead, and anything. And then he'd get those 30, 40 yard pitch shots, and that's exactly what Craig's talking about. Even with a bit of grain, he could do it because he had phenomenal hands. That's the real key to this is to having that good lie as well if you have get that lie which is a little bit dodgy it's kind of hard to spin it you just want to make good contact and, and let it release a little i probably should say to adam is that a lot of people get confused when they have their hands behind the ball they're like well how am i going to get it under the ball what good players do is they lean forward they put their pressure of their lower body forward so that they can almost they keep their their body moving or body weight moving forward so the club can slide under the ball. If you've got your body weight back and your hands back, well, now you're going to blade it across the green. So that's that's not great. You've got to have that, that body weight, certainly lower body forward and the upper body a little bit behind. Yeah, I, I totally agree. If, if anything, you know, I think the best short game players out there use their legs really well through the ball. The hands kind of follow um, that, that weight on the left side for a right-hander. The best ones, if you watch their lower body, don't really watch their hands through the ball. The lower body's leading everything, and the hands just kind of along for the ride. What I find with a lot of club golfers out there, they tend to get a little flippy through the ball and use a bit too much hand action. How much time do you spend practicing, Nick, that shot? Quite Um, a bit. Um, I I mean, look, length was never my strong suit, so I I had to make up uh, in the game in other areas. So I practiced a lot of wedges, 
a lot of chipping, bunkers, putting. That that short game was really two thirds of my time, um, and then I kind of fine tune my full swing. So that that pitch shot and the, especially wedges from I'd say forty to fifty meters to one hundred and ten, one hundred and twenty meters. That was the area where I could really really make up ground on on others. And um, you know, they, having the feel and the touch. Fortunately, I've I've got some nice hands around the green, so I can uh, I can work that magic a bit. There's so many questions to ask from this discussion, but to both of you, first of all, for those that want to practice this sort of thing, because it's the sort of thing you can go down to the park or to the local oval and make sure the curator's not uh, watching. <laughs> but are there some sort of drills or some competitions you can do to sort of add a bit of competitiveness to the practice, rather than just going down and hitting balls for the sake of it, where you can actually create that little bit of on course intensity to get that improvement i would say that i remember playing practice rounds with um chucky fowler peter mm-hmm. fowler who sevy in sevy's book named peter fowler the best short game he'd played with that's right nick Correct, yep. yeah. that's how good peter fowler was and he would is. drop when he played practice round is sorry sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry peter in practice rounds he would drop a ball at 40 a ball at 60 and a ball at eight, especially if no one was watching and the you know the tour guys weren't going to get him in trouble. And he'd pitch it into each hole. He might do that six, seven, eight times per round. So for the average punter, go out, play nine holes, drop a ball at 60, drop a ball at 30, pitch him into the green, pick him up and do it again on the next hole and the next, play six holes, and now you've hit 15 pitch shots on course in real time and see how many you get up and down or get within a 15 to 20 foot range yeah that's the best way to practice i think on course in in conditions that that are real how would you do it nick yeah i I agree i mean if i'm on the range you can you know make some games up where there's a bit of uh, competitive aspect to it at the end i I like to work a bit on technique to begin um, do a bit of skill work in the middle and then finish off with a competitive game where uh, depending on the skill level of the person you might step out say three to four paces from a hole put circle, you know, tease all in a circle around a hole and then step back 10, 20, 30, 40 yards and say, okay, this is my goal. I'm going to get five out of 10 from this distance within the circle. And if you miss or you don't get that, well, sorry, you got to keep going until you get it. Um, make the goal realistic, but a little challenging. I think that's good. That's on the driving range. On the golf course, I love that game Craig talks about. Uh, a favorite of mine is I usually play nine holes where I, I play a regular ball and then I play a wedge and a short game ball. So I play three balls out. Uh, the wedge ball varies on every hole, and it's a part two for me. The wedge ball, and also the chipping and and you know the the short game ball. That's a part two. See what your score is at the end. Write down how far your proximity is to the hole, and try and get better every time you go out that way. So that's a great little game to play if you've got a nine holes and you've got a bit of time on your hands. Well, thank you for coming in today. There's so many questions I want to ask you over the next few weeks with different shots yep. to play, to learn, to practice, all those sorts of things. So I think I hope that everyone that is listening now can get something out of what you're going to bring to the show. And I'll film a video tomorrow. Yep. And I'll flick it in. All right. We'll put it on the PGA social media uh, network, and we'll also do it through uh, RSN as well. And uh, so we can all play like a Patrick Cantlay from inside 60 metres. Beautiful. <laughs> Fantastic. Craig Spence uh, joining us on the PJ Golf Club. That's all we've got time for for today. Nick, thanks very much for coming in. We really appreciate it to have someone of your calibre in our studios talking golf. It's, uh, it's been a real treat. Thanks for having me. And thanks, BJ. Thanks, Whitey. We'll catch you all again this week.